hello everyone. Welcome back. My name is Wesley. This is Wu Can Cook. Uh, today I'm cooking a Thai noodle dish called Pad Si Yu. Uh, if you've never had Pad Si Yu, it's, uh, I feel like, pretty common. At least here in America, it's one of the more common noodle dishes that you will find coming up in, like, Thai noodle or, like, Thai takeout cuisine. Uh, uh, if you've been tuning in regularly, you'll know that I missed the last couple of streams that I was supposed to be at. That's because I was uh, Christmas and the day before Christmas, so I was off getting COVID tested and stuff, so. Um, but I'm back, and we'll be back to our regular schedules, which is uh, every Tuesday and Thursday at 6.30 PST, uh, and Wednesdays at 6 o'clock PST. Uh, if you're looking for something to watch on Mondays, the reason that I never stream on Mondays is because I host another show on Monday uh, called Monday Meals with Wu Can Cook. That's over on the Bay Street Emeryville Facebook page every Monday at 6 o'clock. Uh, and if you're ever wondering why I never cook stuff that doesn't come from Asian cuisine, it's because uh, those uh, cuisines always pop up on Monday meals. So if you're interested in seeing me cook like a pan-seared steak or something like that, uh, all that stuff pops up on Monday meals. Uh, but today we're doing Thai noodles, which is Pad Si Yu. Uh, pad Si Yu, if you're not familiar, relies very heavily on the use of dark soy sauce, which is... Um, very different from regular soy sauce. So if you've never used dark soy sauce before, I highly recommend that you do, but also uh, be very careful with it because it is very, very different from the way that regular soy sauce behaves, especially if you're used to cooking with uh, low sodium soy sauce like I do. Uh, and the reason for that is because dark soy sauce is a lot more concentrated uh, and a little bit more like uh, sweet, I guess, a little bit more sweet than uh, regular soy sauce, so you can't use it in similar or same fashion that you use regular soy sauce because uh, if you were to do that, you would definitely over season what you're cooking. So, uh, we're gonna run through some of the things that I like to do when I use dark soy sauce, uh, how I like to approach those sorts of things, uh, and just generally how I like to approach a pad CU. So, I've definitely done pad CU on a stream before. Um, if you have watched these streams before, if you've watched any of the other Pad CU recipes or attempts that I've done before, you'll know that I have messed it up many times, and that's because the first couple of times that I bought or did Pad CU, uh, I went out and bought some fresh chow fun, which is very, very essential to uh, making Pad CU. Uh, and every single time that I did it, uh, the chow fun went bad. Uh, and then we ended up using the wrong kind of noodle, uh, which is generally okay, but it's a real bummer and it's a very different kind of. Uh, noodle dish that you end up with. So, uh, if you have any questions for me, feel free to drop your questions in the comments. Uh, I don't know everything about Pad CU, but I know lots of stuff, so hopefully I can be helpful or, or informative or at the very least entertaining to watch. So, um, the particular Pad CU that we're doing today uh, derives from, well, it comes from a recipe that I wrote uh, and released earlier today. Actually, it was supposed to be out yesterday, but I forgot to post it because I was busy doing Christmas stuff. Um, but the version that I wrote this recipe, uh, the, the version of this particular dish that I wrote is loosely based off of a version that you find here in Oakland uh, from a restaurant called Nicha Thai. Uh, Nicha Thai is uh, in the Oakland Grand Lake area, uh, and it happens to be across the street from where I used to live many years ago. Uh, so I used to order like takeout from Nicha Thai a long time ago, uh, pretty frequently. Um, and my particular, the particular reason why I like the Nicha Thai version uh, in specifically is because it derives, uh, a lot of its influences are very inspired by American cuisine. Um, so it's still like, I feel like the flavor palette stays pretty true to traditional Thai cuisine or Thai cooking. Um, but a lot of the ingredients and the way that they sort of approach the use of veggies in it uh, comes a lot out of a lot of like uh, like Thai American cuisine or just like generally uh, been a little bit Americanized in a way that uh, is particularly uh, I like it um, uh, Which means that the Thai uh, Pad Siu that we're making today is uh, probably not the most traditional Pad Siu although it definitely has a lot of traditional Thai tendencies uh, we're going to be drawing um, some like American influences uh, in a few different places, mainly in the use of broccoli. We're going to be using broccoli instead of gailan, which would be uh, more like commonly referred to as Chinese broccoli, uh, or s s pretty similar to mustard greens, I guess, um, or those are two different veggies. Um, but uh, I personally hate gailan uh, because I kind of grew up eating it, uh, and it is very, very gross to me uh, because it's super bitter, and it's just one of those vegetables that when I was a kid, I used to have to choke down a lot at the end of dinner because uh, I didn't eat my veggies. Uh, so it's one of those things that as an adult, I just really have a strong distaste for gailan or Chinese broccoli. Um, so 
Uh, I love that this particular recipe does not use gailan uh, and it has a few different tricks that uh, we're going to use today uh, that make it possible that for us to get away with using regular old broccoli, uh, mainly having to do with the way that we cut it. So. Uh, as with pretty much every recipe, I started off by fine mincing, crushing and then fine mincing some garlic, followed by fine mincing some ginger uh, after peeling it with a spoon. Uh, you'll notice that almost every recipe that I have ever written, or at least almost every savory recipe that I have ever written, um, at least in like the Asian-centric cuisine, uh, starts off with those two ingredients, and that's because those two ingredients tend to be our first uh, two steps in building out umami, not because we like to impart ginger and the flavor of ginger and garlic and everything, but more because uh, it just those tend to be like the two fundamental building blocks of uh, where we start when we build out umami. So um, when we start out with garlic and ginger, it's not because we're trying to make everything taste like garlic and ginger, although uh, those are definitely predominant flavors in a lot of Asian cooking, uh, but it's more because those happen to be like uh, two really strong fundamental building blocks to start like building your castle. So we add ginger and garlic, uh, as aromatic elements to our wok at the very beginning uh, and then once we have a nice like baseline uh, layer of umami uh, we sort of build on top of it. Alright so for my broccoli uh, I'm going to, I haven't quite decided how many florets I'm going to use but I think I'm going to use all of this um, and more specifically we're being very careful about the way that I'm chopping this broccoli uh, and that is because the way that we chop this broccoli needs to be pretty similar to the way that gailan is shaped. So, uh, in order for that to make sense, you have to know what gailan looks like. Uh, gailan is very long. It doesn't really look like regular broccoli or like traditional broccoli at all. Uh, it's long and thin, uh, and it has a lot of leafy uh, green elements to it. So, uh, what we take away from that is the reason that it works in a wok is uh, very much because of the shape. Uh, so a long, thin veggie, when you throw it into a wok and flash cook it on high heat, like, like you do with most wok veggies, uh, will flash cook very easily because it's very long, very thin, and not very, uh, it's not going to take much heat to get at least a little bit of a cook on it. So uh, if we were to throw, say, like a large piece of broccoli like this into our wok, uh, what would happen is that piece of broccoli would end up undercooking or overcooking, and then other smaller pieces would undercook. So. Uh, we don't want to do that, so in order to make sure that these do cook properly, uh, we're cu cutting them in a very, very similar shape to how you would see gailan. So uh, long, thin, uh, kind of in a spear shape, uh, generally making sure that we don't have very large, um, yeah, large and thick clumps of broccoli. Uh, otherwise, those are definitely going to undercook. So. Uh, and that is going to be a big part of how we make sure that these bro uh, this our broccoli uh, is cooked properly. So uh, this is also the reason why when you see the use of regular broccoli like this uh, come up on most recipes, uh, the reason the reason that it you would very very rarely would see broccoli just thrown straight into a pan uh, is because it doesn't cook properly. Um, most of the time when you see at least like uh, I want to say like American preparations, but I feel like I I don't know a lot about French cooking, but I feel like French cooking or just general like European cooking. Uh, in that context, you will see it cooked uh, with a par cook first. So very, very frequently, uh, if you've ever prepared broccoli before, uh, you'll know that you have most frequently when you cook it, you probably do something to par cook it to make sure that it cooks evenly. Uh, so sometimes you might see steamed or boiled, uh, baked sometimes. All of these things are pretty traditional preparations of broccoli. Uh, sometimes you'll even like, you'll steam it and then you'll bake it. Or, or sometimes you'll steam it and then stir fry it. Uh, all of those things, the reason that you do that with broccoli is because broccoli is a super, super sturdy vegetable. Uh, and if you try and just flash cook it or just throw it into a pan uh, and stir fry it, uh, that's not really gonna cook super well because it probably is too thick uh, and too durable to cook in like that short amount of time. Uh, so very frequently what you would end up doing uh, is par cooking it. So uh, in Asian cooking, you very, very infrequently will see the use of a par cook, uh, mostly because wok cooking happens on very, very high heat. Uh, but definitely uh, for this particular iteration, it's because you're not supposed to be using broccoli, you're supposed to be using gailan. So, uh, in order to get around that, uh, in order to make sure that our broccoli uh, par uh, flash cooks the way that it should in a wok, uh, has to do, we have to be very careful with the way that it looks when we chop it. So, 
Um, if you're just tuning in, it kind of looks like this. Uh, we're making sure that our broccoli is long, thin, uh, and kind of spear-like, uh, and that's to make sure that everything cooks properly. And the leftover turkey meat. Nice. That's cool. All right, uh, hello to everyone just joining. My name is Wesley. Uh, this is Wu Can Cook. Um, if you've watched these streams before, you'll probably have seen me make Pad, pad CU. You. Uh, you probably have also seen me um, do a very poor Pad CU before because I have messed this recipe up many, many times. Uh, but I did finally figure out how to do it perfectly. Uh, and that is actually up on my YouTube channel. So if you're not already watching or all already following us on YouTube, uh, that's over at youtube.com slash wukancook, which if you're watching on Reddit is the YouTube channel at the bottom of the screen. Uh, and that's where all of the recipe videos that go along with the things that I live stream will eventually uh, pop up, including the recipe for this video or for this live stream, uh, which came out earlier today, I think this morning. Um, so lots of stuff like that. Uh, I kind of took a little bit more time and slowed down a little bit. Uh, it took a little bit more time to walk through all of the things that I'm doing. Some of the decision making that decision making that goes behind uh, the recipe itself. Uh, kind of talking my way through it, and uh, also kind of diving into uh, the restaurant that this is derived from, which is Nicha Ta here in Oakland. Uh, so lots of stuff like that popping up on the YouTube channel. I just started doing a whole series on reproducing uh, foods uh, from local restaurants here in the San Francisco Bay Area. So we did. Uh, another Westlake soup uh, a couple weeks ago. Oh, that was last week uh, from a restaurant in San Francisco called Dragon House. Uh, this particular pad CU is based off of a pad CU from a restaurant here in Oakland called Nicha Thai. Uh, so if you happen to be in the San Francisco Bay Area or particularly in the Oakland area, especially specifically around Lake Merritt, uh, you might know some of these restaurants because uh, they're all recipes that are based off of things that I have eaten a lot. So, um, so. Uh, if you are interested in content like that, maybe uh, cooking some of this stuff yourself and not just watching me cook it, or just watching me cook more stuff on the internet, uh, that's a fun place to be um, because lots of fun stuff popping up over there. So uh, if you're not already subscribed or if you are subscribed and are just watching me uh, on the live stream on YouTube, I recommend hopping over there. Oh, also, uh, in addition to the recipes, I have also started live streaming on YouTube uh, where I will generally be announcing uh, everything that I cook uh, at least a day or two ahead of time. Uh, I posted what I was going to be cooking today a couple days ago, and that's a really great place to be if you want to cook alongside me and maybe not just watch me, you could also cook with me, uh, which some folks have started doing. Uh, so uh, you can like find the things that I'm gonna be cooking and then you can cook with me and then you can ask me about things that you make mistakes on because uh, I know that I make lots and lots of mistakes. So YouTube, fun place to be. Uh, if you haven't already, pop over and subscribe. We're working our way uh, to 1,000 subscribers by the end of the month. Uh, we have a lot of watchers, so hopefully we can do that. That's cool. 3,000 viewers. That's neat. Oh, man. Yeah. So if you guys have any questions, feel free to drop your questions in the comments. Uh, lots of times I miss questions, so if I don't answer your questions, feel free to just repeat it. Uh, because uh, sometimes the chat scrolls really, really fast and I miss it. How do you deal with stuttering? Uh... I don't know. Uh, mostly just like having a lot of, or just like saying the same thing a lot. Uh, so lots of time, I've been doing this, these streams a lot lately. So when I first started, I had a lot of trouble figuring out what to say all the time. Uh, so like what to talk about and kind of like figuring out all those things uh, over time, once you sort of figure out and get familiar with what you're doing, um, you get a, a little bit more comfortable and a little less stuttery. Um, I'm actually not a chef by trade. Uh, I play music for a living uh, in a band called Trace Repeat. Uh, so I spend a lot of time on stage, just sort of like talking. Uh, like I guess like a lot of public speaking comes with being a, a like a stage musician. So uh, a lot of like how I approach speaking publicly comes from just like uh, playing in a band and just being comfortable talking to people in public. I guess. Good question though. Yeah, it is hard to like it is hard to speak without stuttering for sure. Why is it called pad CU? Uh, I'm not really sure. I believe the term pad uh, refers to noodles, which is the type of noodle, uh, which is why uh, when you uh, like look at dishes on Thai noodles, um, you'll see the term pad as the prefix for a lot of different noodles. So things like pad CU, pad kimao, pad um, pad Thai, um, things like that. All of those all of those are the have the prefix pad, which I think refers to rice noodles. Um, but uh, I'm not Thai. I don't speak Thai, so. 
I'm not super familiar. Yeah, uh, so uh, tonight I'm using uh, chicken thigh. I believe in the original recipe that I wrote, uh, which is up on YouTube, I did this with chicken breast. Uh, and that was because I didn't have a very, wasn't super happy with the use of chicken breast, although I think I did, um, I think the logic behind using chicken breast was solid. Um, but the reason that the original recipe uses chicken breast is because the dark soy sauce that we're going to be using is very, very heavy and very, very thick. Uh, so I found that the use of uh, chicken breast sort of helps to cut through some of the richness that you're getting with that sauce, uh, which is can be a little bit distracting if you have an excessive amount of fat, which is what comes from chicken breast or chicken thigh. So uh, chicken thigh happens to be a lot fattier uh, and a lot richer than chicken breast. So I found uh, that using chicken thigh uh, will add a little bit more fat uh, and a little bit more richness. So uh, in this particular case, I uh, started leaning more towards chicken uh, chicken thigh lately. Um, but I kind of go back and forth, and honestly, lots of times, uh, what I end up using happens. Well, what I happen to end up using on a given night uh, just has to do with what was already defrosted. So uh, I was act actually at the grocery store today, and I just bought this chicken uh, chicken thigh, so it wasn't frozen. So that's really the main reason why I'm using chicken thigh today is because it wasn't frozen, so I didn't have to defrost it. So. Oxidation on the leg, yeah, actually. So it's a this is so this is a carbon steel knife. Uh, there's not a whole lot of oxidation, but there's definitely more oxidation than if you were looking at like a stainless steel knife. Uh, the main reason that you're seeing a lot of oxidation is because this is made of carbon steel, uh, which means so it's I wouldn't necessarily call it like oxidation. It's more like patina, uh, which is sort of like a wear that shows over time. Uh, which is actually the reason why I love carbon steel so much is because it sort of wears uh, and it shows like it kind of just shows its age so uh, I love doing that part in particular so um, for the same reason so if you've ever seen my walk uh, anyone who's probably followed these streams before have seen this walk uh, this walk is is black now and that all of that is has to do with the patina and seasoning of the walk uh, before I started using it a lot it kind of looked like this handle which is like bright silver uh, and all of that dark coating uh, comes from the seasoning and like uh, patina of the wok over use over over time um, so yeah that's definitely uh, why the knife has so much oxidation it's because it's made of carbon steel Ooh. all right um, okay, so next for my chicken thigh, uh, I'm gonna do a pretty quick marinade. Uh, our sauce is already very, very heavy, um, so I'm not gonna be super complicated with the way that I marinate this. I'm going to keep it pretty simple because uh, I don't want to add too much richness to the chicken itself. Uh, mostly just looking to impart a little bit of depth of flavor uh, without getting in the way of the dark soy sauce that we're going to be adding later. All right, so I'm starting with, this is going to be four tablespoons of soy sauce. And then, let's see, a pinch of kosher salt. Uh, and then two tablespoons of Shaoxing wine. Shaoxing wine, definitely not traditional to Thai food, um, but I think it adds a little bit of sweetness and a little bit of brightness that really helps in marinades. So. Uh, I have started using it in a lot of marinades because it helps just develop a little bit of depth of flavor that works uh, really, really well. So, uh, if you haven't tried it yet, highly recommend it. Uh, if you can't find Shaoxing wine, a uh, good substitute is just plain old dry cooking sherry, um, which I think is a little bit more readily available, and I'm pretty sure Shaoxing wine is essentially just dry cooking sherry. All right, so I'm tossing in, that's a star anise pod. Star anise pod, if you've never used it before, I think is the, in my opinion, the predominant or prevailing uh, season that you get from Chinese five spice. Uh, and it's sort of that like really bright, uh, very like um, aggressive flavor that you get from Chinese five spice. Um, so the last thing that I'm going to use is a pinch of white pepper, which I have also started using in a lot of uh, raw chicken marinades. Uh, just because I feel like it binds really well with marinades, so uh, I love doing that. Uh, white pepper, if you're not familiar, uh, comes up on like serving tables a lot. So 
Uh, you will very frequently see white pepper in like the Lazy Susan uh, in a Chinese restaurant next to the soy sauce because uh, uh, you, lots of times folks will, oops, we're on the wrong, my bad. Thank you for catching that. Uh, lots of times you will see uh, white pepper uh, on the table next to next to soy sauce because lots of people like to use uh, white pepper in soups. So uh, that's another, like probably the more common use of white pepper is in soups. Um, but I feel like it works really, really well uh, in marinades too. So uh, that's it for our marinade. If you're really committed, uh, you want more specifically, you want to give that star anise pod a good amount of time to sort of marinate uh, in the chicken. So you probably, if you're really committed, probably about an hour. Uh, we're not going to do that. That's probably we'll probably go for like maybe 15 minutes and it'll be just fine. Uh, but the longer you let it marinate, this is going to be true for anything that's raw chicken. Uh, the more flavor, your you, more depth of flavor you will be able to impart. Right. Uh, next up, this is just two eggs. Uh, nothing fancy with our eggs. These are the last things that's going to go into our noodles. Uh, you will find the use of eggs come up very, very last in a lot of Thai noodle dishes uh, for the specific reason that when you add eggs to Thai noodles, uh, unlike if you were to add eggs to, say, uh, fried rice, your goal is not to create scrambled eggs. Your goal is to coat your rice noodles in eggs. Uh, so we add it at the very, very end so that our eggs end up coated in rice noodles. So that's probably a quality uh, that you associate with a lot of things like a lot of Thai noodle dishes, really anything with rice noodles uh, is rice noodles that are have like an egg coating as opposed to say like a fried rice, uh, which is like rice with curds of scrambled eggs in, um, incorporated, uh, which is very different. So. Uh, how do you make a wok work on a regular home range? Great question. So uh, it depends what kind of range you have. Um, today I have uh, what I'm using today is uh, gas range, um, and it is nothing special. It's just a straight, straightforward gas range. Uh, lots of folks think that you can't uh, use um, you can't use a wok on a home range, which is absolutely not true. Uh, it just just means that you have to approach it a little bit differently. Um, so it means that the way that you approach cooking uh, on a home range uh, is very, very different from the way that you approach cooking in a restaurant. Uh, whereas in a restaurant, the the restaurant burners that they have get a lot, lot hotter than how hot your home, home range will be able to get. Uh, and for that, for that specific reason, lots of folks think that because your range doesn't get hot, hot enough, um, you can't use a wok on a home range, which is absolutely not true. Uh, it just means that you have to approach the way that you use the wok a little bit differently. So mainly what happens when you use a wok on a home range, since you don't have that super high heat, uh, as you add more things to the wok, uh, the temperature of the wok gradually starts decreasing. So if you add a bunch of stuff to a wok, uh, which is very tempting to do because woks are really, really large. So it's very tempting to just keep throwing stuff into the wok because it will fit and it's not going to overflow. Um, what happens is as you get more stuff in that wok, uh, eventually the wok's temperature is going to just completely drop to nothing. So I've even done stuff uh, where where I added so many things to the wok that it was like you could stick your hand in it and it wasn't, wasn't very hot. Uh, and that's because woks don't have a lot of heat retention in the way that your standard like skillet will. And that's because skillets have really, really heavy bottoms on the, on the bottom of the pan. And that bottom, that really heavy bottom uh, allows your pan to have a lot of heat retention. So since you don't have that heavy bottom, we use a process called uh, batch cooking, uh, which is the process of uh, cooking some stuff in the wok and then we're going to remove it and then cook our next element uh, and then remove that and then at the very end uh, we're going to throw all of those things back into the wok at the very very end just long enough to toss it all together uh, and then combine it. Uh, so what happens is since you removed everything as you were cooking uh, you have this opportunity to use really really high wok heat without actually um, ever adding everything to the wok at one time. So since, since there's no point uh, in your in your real cook time that you're ever actually uh, adding everything to the wok, there's no point where uh, in your cook you're actually dropping all of the temperature out of your wok. So uh, you have this ability to cook on really, really high heat without uh, sacrificing, um, like, well, I guess wok hay is what, uh, what someone mentioned earlier, which is uh, that, that quality of wok cooking that we're really, really looking for. So um, I'm going to be running through some of uh, the batch cooking process today too. So. Uh, Stick around and I will, I will show you. Love your streams. Oh yeah, thank you. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, I should, I guess I should introduce myself. Hello to everyone just joining. My name is Wesley. Uh, this is Wu Can Cook. I saw someone ask if this was the record number of streams on Reddit. 
Uh, I don't think it's the record, but it, it is a, there are a lot of people watching right now, which is super cool. Uh, I do stream every um, very frequently, so I'm streaming every Tuesday and Thursday at 6.30 PST, uh, and Wednesdays at 6 o'clock. Uh, and then occasionally I stream on weekends. I don't stream every weekend, but I stream uh, sometimes whenever I have time. But uh, always Tuesdays, Thursdays, 6.30 PST, Wednesdays at 6 o'clock. Uh, if you haven't popped over yet, I highly recommend hopping over to the YouTube channel uh, where we are also simultaneously streaming, which is the computer behind us. Uh, and over on YouTube, that's where I will be announcing uh, all of the things that we cook on stream. Uh, and that's that's so that uh, I usually will announce it, or I'm going to do my best to keep announcing stuff uh, a couple days beforehand. And so that, that's so uh, you can uh, review the things that we're going to be cooking. Uh, check out the recipe list, and if you want, you can pick up some of those ingredients and cook it alongside me. Uh, generally, we're moving pretty slow, so we can uh, like work our way through uh, mistakes that we make and all of those things. We can do all of that together, which is always more fun because I know that I make lots and lots of mistakes when I cook stuff too. So um, That's over on YouTube along with the recipe videos for everything that I cook. So I released the recipe video for uh, this Pad CU earlier today. Uh, yeah, a couple hours ago even, I think. Uh, and that, that res those recipe videos generally move a little bit slower. I kind of take my more time uh, and spend a little bit more time like thinking about what I want to talk about and sort of like working my way through all of the decision making that goes behind the recipe videos or like uh, sort of like explaining some of the decision making, why we use certain ingredients, why I'm like uh, leaning towards chicken thigh today, why I'm leaning towards chicken breast, stuff like that. All of those things will come up on the uh, recipe videos. Uh, so uh, if you are interested in reproducing some of these things yourself and not just watching me cook it or if you just want to watch me cook it uh, or if you want to cook alongside me all of that stuff over on YouTube so very fun place to be uh, if not uh, hello from everyone on reddit uh, the YouTube channel I'm talking about is at the bottom of the screen which is youtube.com slash who can cook so lots of fun stuff over there cool uh, next up uh, I'm gonna do the sauce for my pad CU uh, very frequently, if you've seen folks cook this in a restaurant, you'll see them just dump all of these things straight into the wok, uh, oftentimes with a big old like soup ladle. Uh, I love doing sauces off heat, uh, and that's so that you can get a chance to really taste uh, your sauce and kind of understand what your sauce is going to taste like before it goes into the wok, uh, so that you can make adjustments too. Um, if you're not super familiar with a recipe, or if you don't have total faith in your recipe that it's going to come out well, uh, this is a good uh, good technique to use. Alright, so that was two tablespoons each of dark soy sauce and dark vinegar, both of which are a little bit sweeter than their uh, more typical counterparts, which is regular soy sauce and plain old rice vinegar. So, uh, if you don't have those two elements, I'm pretty sure you could probably substitute for just plain old soy sauce and plain old rice vinegar. Although I do think that dark soy sauce is pretty essential uh, to pad CU. So I think uh, if there's one ingredient that you absolutely have to have from this recipe, uh, it's dark soy sauce. Uh, next, this is four tablespoons of fish sauce, which is going to be a little bit of fermented sweetness. I think also uh, fish sauce is one of those iconic uh, qualities about uh, Thai noodles that you will find, uh, especially with things like pad CU. Uh, did I get my inspiration from Yan Ken Cook? Yes. Yeah. I'm glad that people know who Yan Ken Cook is. Uh, for those of you not familiar, Yan Ken Cook uh, was a chef from the 90s who had a show on PBS. Uh, his name was Martin Yan, and he had a show uh, called Yan Ken Cook. <clears throat> and uh, I used to watch it a lot when I was a little kid, uh, and it was sort of like where I learned uh, a lot about like Chinese cooking. Uh, and Yan Ken Cook, uh, Martin Yan had this thing about his show where would, he would use one of these giant cleavers uh, and chop really, really fast, but look deadpan and like have this goofy looking smile and look deadpan into the camera and then chop super, super fast. And you're like, how is he doing that? Uh, that was that was Martin Yan. He was one of my favorites growing up. <clears throat> so I started this. I started this Reddit channel and then the YouTube channel following it uh, based off of the inspiration of Martin Yan. So uh, and Martin Yan's uh, tagline was Yan can cook, so can you, which is the title on the subscriber box over there, uh, and that's where it comes from. Yeah, uh, Wu can cook, so can you. Derives from Yan can cook. All right, so this is two tablespoons of sambal olek. Uh, I've gone back and forth on a bunch of different spices to use for this recipe. Uh, I tried dobanjang, I tried uh, gochujang, 
Um, I tried even black bean taste, uh, sauce, uh, all of which are not quite what you're looking for. Uh, sambal olek, although it's like very, so I feel like in the realm of like Asian hot sauces, sambal olek is probably like the most basic white girl uh, version. Uh, but the reason that it's so basic is because it's very, very classic. Uh, and more importantly, it is very, very essential to Thai cooking. So I've experimented with a whole bunch of other things. Uh, but I have to say that I, the reason that I settled on sambal olek after trying so many different things is because it is, that is absolutely the flavor that you're looking for, sambal olek. So. All right, uh, that was also two tablespoons of oyster sauce, which is uh, also really important. I would say if you don't have uh, dark soy sauce and you really can't get your hands on it, uh, that would be the next thing that I would add uh, is doubling the dark, uh, uh, oyster sauce. <coughs> Ooh, I forgot to do this. Uh, I'm gonna add one more thing uh, to my chicken marinade. I'm gonna add a tiny pinch of cornstarch. Uh, Cornstarch I found, especially in wok cooking, if you add a tiny bit of cornstarch to your chicken marinades or your meat marinades, uh, I'm, and I really mean a tiny bit, this is like maybe a quarter teaspoon. Uh, it helps um, kind of protect the meat against like the really, really aggressive cooking cook heat of a wok. Uh, and it helps, helps get like a really, really tender chicken uh, without like overcooking it. So um, it, I've just found that like coating the chicken in a little bit of cornstarch uh, will help you get like, like a really, really strong sear on your chicken uh, without like getting overcooked chicken. So uh, the first couple of times that I did this recipe, I used way too much uh, cornstarch. So I really mean you have to use a very, very small amount, like like no kidding, like a quarter teaspoon, no, no more than that. Um, because the more cornstarch that you add, uh, the more thick your sauce is going to end up and you will eventually run into a world where you have a very thick uh, and mushy pad siu, which I did, I think, m maybe the first three times that I tried this recipe, I think I did that, so. Uh, I think when I first started doing it, I used two tablespoons of it, uh, and that was a bad idea. Don't do that. All right, uh, last up, this is going to be some uh, Thai chilies. Um, before I started using Thai chilies for this recipe, I also used uh, just plain old um, jalapenos. Uh, which also works too, but I do have to say that the use of Thai chilies is very specifically the flavor of Thai food. Um, so if you're looking for the ingredient that makes Thai food taste like Thai food and not just like American food or even like Chinese food, uh, this is the one. You really have to have Thai chilies um, and there is no real substitute for it. So uh, I did try this recipe with jalapenos a few times and it works just fine. Uh, I would say is if you don't have Thai chilies, probably just leave them out completely. Um, you'll also notice that I'm not deseeding my ch uh, Thai chilies, which I very, very rarely will do. Uh, I deseed almost every chili that I use, mostly because I don't really like super hot foods. Um, but I feel like the high heat and like the really high levels of capsaicin that you get from um, Thai chilies are really, really essential to the way that they taste. So um, in this particular case, I'm not leaving any of these seeds out, although I may uh, maybe toss some of them out. Um, but if you're particularly averse to really spicy stuff, uh, I would say either deseed it or just leave these out entirely. I know that uh, in a traditional pad CU, um, the use of Thai chili probably not super common. Uh, and I think this is maybe six Thai chilies, six or eight. I wasn't counting. That is it. Right. So, uh, if you are using Thai chilies, remember because we left these seeds in, uh, these bad boys are gonna start smoking up real hot uh, as soon as you throw it into that wok. So, uh, and that smoke is going to be super caustic too. So. Uh, when you throw it out, uh, throw it into your wok, make sure that you open your windows too because that stuff will definitely get in your throat and you're gonna have some trouble breathing if you don't open your windows. So uh, my windows are wide open and my smoke detectors are switched off. Uh, remember, when if you are using these Thai chilies, be very, very careful because uh, they are absolutely going to start smoking up. We just had 100 subs on YouTube. That's awesome, cool. Thanks for the update. This stupid bar is not working. Also, Ham Charles is not working. I don't know what's up with Streamlabs. Streamlabs sometimes doesn't work, but that's super awesome. Uh, I'm super stoked that we just hit 1,000 subscribers. 
Uh, we've been kind of like slowly crawling our way to 1,000, um, but I'm super glad that I uh, hopped on stream today. So, um, for those of you just joining, my name is Wesley. This is Wu Can Cook. Uh, today I'm cooking a pad CU, which if you're not familiar, I would say at least to here in America, uh, is one of the like super super common uh, Thai noodles that you will find in like pad Thai or like Thai noodle takeout. Um, so in the list of like when you go uh, to a Thai restaurant in America, specifically, especially here in the Bay Area, uh, and you look at their noodle dishes, probably the first thing that you'll see is like pad uh, pad Thai. Uh, maybe the second thing that you see might be like uh, drunken noodles or uh, pad pad Kim Mao. Probably the third thing is Pad Siu. Um, uh, and really, actually, the more that I've investigated this, Pad Siu and Pad, Thai, uh, pad Siu and Pad Kim Mao are, are basically the same dish with a couple different ingredients added. So uh, the thing that we're making today, uh, because I'm actually going to throw in some bean sprouts before they go bad, uh, is probably closer to a drunken noodle or a Pad Kim Mao because it has extra veggies in it. Um, but in my, what I've discovered is that, like, other than a couple of things that go into the sauce, uh, because we're adding extra veggies and uh, Thai, Thai chilies, the thing that we're making today is basically drunken noodles or pad, si, uh, pad kimao. Um, but uh, if you're interested in reproducing what I'm cooking today, I recommend hopping over to the YouTube channel uh, where you'll um, all of the recipe videos that go along with pretty much everything that I cook on stream, including the recipe for this particular stream. Uh, and that's up on youtube.com slash cook. A couple folks already are watching us on YouTube, uh, which is super cool. Um, we just hit 1,000 subscribers, which is great because we've been working our way to hitting 1,000 subscribers by the end of the month, uh, which is uh, really exciting, and I'm super stoked for that. So uh, I told folks that I would do a refrigerator tour when we hit 1,000 subscribers. So if I forget by the end of the stream, uh, remind me, and I will do that. So very excited. Um, yes, let's see. Uh, other than that, uh, every stream I announce on YouTube, uh, beforehand, uh, generally a couple days beforehand, and that's so that uh, if you're interested in reproducing the things that I'm cooking uh, yourself, or or particularly if you're interested in cooking alongside me and not just watching me cook, uh, lots of folks have been uh, following on YouTube and then uh, picking up the things that we're going to be cooking, so picking up the ingredients. Specifically, if you're going to be cooking what we're cooking today, you would need to pick up chow fun, um, because chow fun in your pantry, uh, and uh, you can cook alongside me. So. Uh, if you're interested in cooking stuff yourself and not just watching me cook stuff, that's a good place to be. Or you can just go over there and watch me cook other stuff on the internet. Also a fun place to be. Um, let's see. What else? A saboteur. Yeah, actually, it's, a, it's not a saboteur, although uh, lots of people assume that. Uh, it's actually a French, a French chef's knife that is very based off of... It's a very close copy of a saboteur called a Père Noir Nougat. Uh, I don't know if I'm butchering that. I think you can see this. Kind of. There's an inscription here. Uh, kind of. Almost. Uh, it's a vintage, uh, vintage French chef's knife, uh, which looks a lot like a saboteur, which is what this is. This is my saboteur, um, which is like a very, very famous French chef's knife. Uh, both, all three of them I got uh, at an estate sale for 15 bucks. That's why they have so much oxidation is because they're old. Uh, okay, last thing I'm gonna do is weigh out some chow fun. So if you don't have chow fun or you were not able to find fresh chow fun, um, the next thing I have used many, many times is just plain old dry, uh, uh, dry, dry rice noodles. Uh, that also works uh, great. Uh, although I will say that the use of chow fun, very, very critical to the way that we make pad tzu. All right, so this is going to be eight ounces of chow fun. Uh, we want to be specific here. Uh, use a gram scale anytime that you can. Uh, I like to use a little bit extra, mostly because when I use chow fun, I'm pretty confident that I'm not going to be able to use the rest of this up before it goes bad. So. Uh, is this my full-time job? Uh, no, actually. Uh, I play music for a living, um, but I'm not really doing any music right now because of COVID. So. Uh, in the interim, I actually got a job hosting cooking shows. Uh, so every Monday, if you've ever wondered why I never stream on Mondays, uh, the reason I don't stream on Mondays is because I stream another show uh, called Monday Meals with Wu Can Cook. That's all on the Bay Street Emeryville Facebook page. Uh, it's also the reason why I never cook any other cuisine other than Asian cuisines. It's because uh, all of the uh, like steaks and uh, pork chops and Brussels sprouts, things like that, uh, that's all on the Monday Meals uh, page. So. 
Uh, if you haven't caught it yet, that I usually will post, uh, post that stuff on the Reddit page uh, for the user profile that we're streaming on right now. Um, but it's also on the Bay Street Emeryville Facebook page, so you can look that up on Facebook. Uh, it's called Monday Meals with Wu Can Cook. <clears throat> uh, is it possible to use udon noodles? Um, maybe. Uh, if you give it a shot, let me know how it goes. Uh, I would say udon noodles are a lot thicker, uh, and I've never tried sautéing udon noodles. Uh, I would say that it might be a weird texture uh, because udon noodles are so thick. Uh, but if you try it, let me know how it goes because I've never actually tried that before. So I'm very curious. All right, so over on our walk, uh, I'm adding our walk. My walk is ripping hot. It's about as hot as a walk is going to get on a home range. Uh, and then I'm adding a, about four tablespoons of vegetable oil. That was maybe a little bit more than four tablespoons. Uh, and I'm giving it a swirl around my wok. This is a process that in Chinese cooking we call lung yao, uh, or what is essentially developing a nice nonstick surface on your wok. Um, uh, and this, this is uh, what we're going to be using to cook on. So very important that you have a nonstick surface. If you don't have a nonstick surface, uh, everything is going to start sticking and you're going to have a bad time. All right, so first up, I'm adding my aromatics. This is my garlic going in, uh, followed by my ginger, uh, and then our Thai chilies. Uh, one more reminder, Thai chilies, very caustic, so make sure your windows are open as soon as you add that stuff in. Uh, and we're just gonna saute that long enough for it to become fragrant. So we're looking uh, for the scent of garlic, ginger, and pepper. Uh, for me, usually about 15 seconds. Uh, but you use your own judgment at this point. Use your nose. All right. Uh, next, I'm adding my chicken. So you will notice uh, our chicken marinade has quite a bit of liquid in it. So I'm actually going to drain it uh, first. We don't want any of this marinade to end up in our wok. Um, uh, all of that is more liquid that we don't want involved. So. Uh, as I add it in, I'm going to I'm doing two things here. I'm making sure that first off, we don't want to throw that star anise pod in, uh, but also we want to reserve about as much of that liquid as we possibly can, uh, because the more liquid that ends up in your wok, uh, the more moisture will build up, and the quicker your wok will start decreasing in heat. All right, uh, so that will take uh, maybe maybe a minute or two. Um, wok heat is very, very hot, hotter than most. Okay, so it goes a little bit quicker. Uh, so you want to be on your toes at this point. Uh, once something's in the wok, uh, it starts happening very quick. All right. What do I love most about cooking? Um, definitely the eating. That's <laughs> definitely the eating is what I love most about cooking. Uh, but also, I think I love uh, the idea, of, like the concept of recipe making. It's it's very creative. Uh, it reminds me a lot of the way that you approach songwriting. Um, it's just like the way you, it's all about like learning the fundamentals, learning how like recipes come together, uh, and then like learning when it's okay to start breaking some of those rules. To me, it, it reminds me a lot of the way that like music theory uh, and um, like songwriting works. All right. So I'm removing my chicken. Uh, if you are, if you've been watching, it is not all the way cooked. It's probably about like 80, 85% cooked through. Uh, so probably a, still a little bit pink. Uh, that's perfectly okay because it is gonna go back into our wok in a bit. Uh, and then next I'm rinsing out everything from our wok uh, and we're gonna start all over again. So uh, I gave my rock, wok a rinse. I'm adding it back to the fire uh, and I'm letting it reheat again, so. Uh, some folks have asked me about this process because it kind of contradicts part of the process of that in French cooking you call it developing fond uh, because essentially what you're rinsing out when you rinse out your wok in a batch cook uh, is all flavor so that's all like the fat uh, and all of the juices and all of that um, like developed caramelized flavor. Um, all of those are things in French cooking that you want to save as much as possible because that all contributes to the development of a sauce. Uh, in this particular case uh, we don't want to leave any of that stuff behind because it will absolutely start burning over time. Um, so, uh, in the process of batch cooking, part of what we're doing is rinsing out some of the... 
uh, some of some of what we're uh, some of what we're rinsing out is a lot of flavor, so it's a real bummer, but it's it's okay. Oh. In the dark. Oh. Uh, are, are we all? Are we dark on YouTube? I don't know if we are. Uh, let me know if YouTube isn't working. It seems to be working okay on, for me. Yeah. All right. Uh, so for batch cooking again, uh, we're rinsing everything out and then we're going to do everything all over again. So uh, reheating our wok, I'm adding a, not as much oil this time, maybe maybe actually four tablespoons this time. Uh, we want to go a little bit easy on the oil because there's a lot of oil in the chicken, which we're going to be adding back to. Uh, and then we're doing the same thing except with our broccoli. So starting with our broccoli going in. Uh, and then we're giving this a toss. Uh, we're not looking to do much to it at this point. We're really uh, just making sure that we're cooking off some of the rawness. So we don't want raw, crunchy bits of broccoli. Although, at this point, you're not really going to be able to cook off a lot of, like, the. you're not going to get a super tender broccoli. And that's very specifically intentional. So we want a pretty crunchy broccoli. That's kind of the quality of uh, wok fried veggies that you will find comes up a lot. Um, is that your wok veggies are going to be a little bit um, like crunchy. So yeah, good, great question. No, we did not steam the broccoli. Uh, we didn't do any par cook at all. So I know that uh, if you're more familiar with like French cooking, uh, that's pretty untraditional um, and very unusual for sure. Uh, and that's because if you don't par cook bro bro uh, broccoli, uh, it's probably going to undercook. So in order to work around that, uh, we chopped the broccoli in a very specific way. So it's cut very, very thin. Uh, and very, very long. Uh, so more specifically, mimicking the way that you would uh, approach, um, or mimicking the way that broccoli looks uh, when you use gailan, which is Chinese broccoli. Uh, and that's that's like what's more traditionally used in a pad si. Uh, great question though. All right, so I'm going off book here and I used a handful of bean sprouts. Uh, the main reason that I'm using bean sprouts is because I have a bunch of bean sprouts and they're gonna go bad if I don't use them. So I'm gonna throw them in. Uh, but if you're trying to stick super traditional for a pad CU, uh, bean sprouts do not belong in a pad CU. <laughs> uh, Alright, so I'm going to let that broccoli go for another, maybe another 30 seconds. Just long enough for it to kind of seem a little bit uh, more tender. Uh, and we're also going to let, oops, there it goes. Uh, we're going to cook off some of the rawness of this, these green sprouts too. And then, should be good. I'm going to do the same thing. I'm adding my chicken back to the wok. But again, uh, I'm reserving some of this liquid. This is a little bit more liquid than I want in my wok. Powell's t-shirt. Yeah, I got this. I did. This is it uh, from Portland. I'm not from Portland. I'm in Oakland, actually. Gordon Ramsay. Yeah, actually, if you that's a that's a great reference, actually, because the the where I got this idea comes from a Gordon Ramsay recipe. So the way that uh, Gordon Gordon Ramsay uh, comes from a Gordon Ramsay recipe, I think it's like three really simple di noodle dishes that you can do. Uh, I, I I forget what the YouTube video was, um, but th that's the way that he does it. He cuts the broccoli very very thin and then throws it straight into. He's using the skillet, which. Uh, I think it's not going to work in a skillet, but uh, that's actually where I got the idea. And it's uh, very specifically uh, cut in a very specific way uh, so that it works with the noodles, uh, with the wok heat. All right, last up, I'm throwing my chow fun into the wok, uh, followed by uh, my sauce. When I use sauces, especially with recipes that I'm not super, super familiar with, uh, I always like to reserve the last, like, uh, maybe third cup, maybe a quarter cup or so. Uh, and that's just to make sure that we don't over season. Uh, so uh, I'm reserving the last quarter cup uh, and then I'm adding everything to combine uh, and then kind of using your, use your judgment at this point. Do you need more sauce? If so, add more sauce. Yes, we do need more sauce. But definitely don't feel obligated to use all of that sauce. Pay attention 
Uh, what does it look like? Does it need, does it need all of it? Uh, and if not, don't use all of it. All right, uh, so the very last thing I'm throwing in is my scrambled eggs or my whisked eggs. Uh, and you'll notice that this happens in a lot of Thai cooking. Uh, the eggs come in very, very last. Uh, and that's because we want to coat our eggs or coat our noodles in that egg. Uh, and that's the quality of egg that you're probably super familiar with uh, when it comes to Thai noodles is rice noodles that are coated in egg. Um, and the reason that they get coated in egg is because it's added at the very, very end. So uh, this is different from the way that you would use uh, egg in say like a fried rice uh, or any pretty much a, or japchae, uh, mushu pork, all of those things. What you're doing is you're adding that egg. Uh, sometimes at the very very beginning uh, and then you get this nice curd egg curd sometimes with japchae or uh, mapo tofu or um, uh, mushu pork uh, you add it very very early and then sometimes you even cook it first and you get a nice uh, almost sometimes it looks like an omelet um, and that's because you want that egg to be independent uh, in this case we're not looking for scrambled eggs we're not looking for egg curds uh, we're looking for egg rice rice noodles that are coated in eggs so we add it at the very very end uh, to make sure that we have nice egg coated noodles. Uh, no, uh, the wok is not nonstick. The wok is carbon steel. Uh, great question though. Uh, the, wok I, the wok that I'm using is a carbon steel wok. Uh, I also have used a lot of stainless steel woks. Uh, actually the wok that I learned how to wok cook on was my parents wok which is a stainless steel wok. Uh, and I almost convinced them to give it to me today. Uh, when I saw them for Christmas, or a couple days ago, when I saw them for Christmas, um, but they didn't give it to me. Uh, but the wok I'm using today is a carbon steel wok. Um, lots of people ask me, like, good recommendations on a wok. Uh, the wok I'm using is literally from the corner store that I got it for like 10 bucks at a restaurant supply store. Um, it's not so much as important, uh, the brand of your wok. What's more important is the quality of metal. Uh, so I love a good carbon steel wok. I've also done a, a lot of cooking on a uh, cast iron wok, which works really great. Uh, the big downside to cast iron woks is that they weigh, no kidding, probably close to like 40 pounds. Uh, so you have to be pretty strong to, to cook with a, car a cast iron wok and you're probably not going to be able to do any wok tossing. Um, but they do retain heat really well, so uh, works really well on a home range. Although you are uh, probably going to break your wrists cooking with that thing. Um, the only thing actually that I would recommend against using uh, is a nonstick wok. Nonstick woks, I don't honestly know why they even exist uh, because nonstick woks don't get hot enough to cook anything in it. Uh, for the same reason that you don't do stir fries in a nonstick skillet. Uh, nonstick skillets, because they have that Teflon coating, the Teflon coating uh, prevents it from uh, getting super hot. Uh, so that's the reason why uh, you can like scramble eggs in a Teflon pan, but you can't like uh, say like sear a steak in a in a Teflon pan. Although I did see someone recently post about searing a steak in a Teflon pan and said it worked great. So, uh, but those are the reasons why we don't use Teflon is because it doesn't get super hot. So uh, that's the same reason why you don't want to use a nonstick wok is because it's not going to get hot enough to do anything. In it. Um, so unfortunately, when you go wok shopping, especially at like big box stores, like uh, if you buy your wok at like Target or like um, like Walmart places like that. Uh, what you end up finding most of the time is nonstick woks, and I don't, for the life of me, understand why that is. All right, so we're ready to eat. So if you've been following along, I did not use all of the sauce. I think I used maybe everything except for like four tablespoons of it or so. Um, so that's a good indicator. Uh, when you use sauces like this, uh, reserve some of it and make sure that you're not over seasoning. So just don't just dump everything in. Uh, pay attention. How much sauce do you actually need? Um, because this is especially when you're using things like dark soy sauce. Uh, it's very easy to over season in this case uh, because dark soy sauce is a very, very aggressive sauce. Uh, it's very thick. Uh, and it will absolutely over-season if you don't uh, use it correctly. So, uh, the last thing we want to do, uh, anytime that you use a wok, uh, uh, is remove everything from the wok. Very, very important, especially if your wok is carbon steel uh, or cast iron. Uh, and that's because uh, that stuff is going to eventually start oxidizing. So, you never want to leave stuff in your wok. Uh, it's super, super... Uh, 
um, tempting to do that because there's finished food that you can now eat in front of you. Uh, but the last thing that you should do anytime that you uh, use your wok uh, is remove it and clean your wok. Uh, super important. Uh, also really important because it's much easier to clean a hot wok uh, than it is to clean a cold wok. Uh, and that's because while your wok is still hot, you still have a very nice non-stick coating on your wok. Um, so I'm removing everything from my wok right now, uh, and then I'm gonna clean it. Uh, same way that we did when we did uh, our batch cooking. Uh, we're removing everything, uh, and then I'm gonna give it a rinse. Uh, and while it's super hot, uh, you still have a very nice non-stick coating, so that means that while you're rinsing, uh, most of this stuff is just gonna come right off um, because we have a nice non-stick coating. So I don't have a camera on the sink, but it looks like this. Um, so back over on the stove. Uh, almost everything I came off, I'd say like 80, like 95% of everything came, came right off just with the rinse. Uh, and that's because while your wok is hot, it has a ni nice nonstick uh, coating. Uh, if you had done that, uh, like say 45 minutes after you finished cooking, uh, so like say you finish cooking and then you start eating and then you come back maybe an hour later and then you uh, uh, get back to doing your dishes, uh, what you would find is when you come back to the wok, everything is now stuck to the wok and that's because uh, once the wok started cooling, all of that not nice non-stick coating that you have on your wok is suddenly gone. Uh, and that means that you now have to do uh, probably a couple of things, none of which are good for your wok. So you're probably going to start scrubbing a little bit. Uh, you might have to get a sponge out. Uh, if it's really bad, you might have to get some steel wool out. Uh, all of those things are things that you don't want to resort to doing with your wok because uh, especially if it's a uh, carbon steel or cast iron, it means that you're probably going to start s uh, scrubbing some seasoning off of your wok. Uh, so th those are all things that you don't want to do. Uh, you generally don't want to be in a world where you have to start scrubbing your wok because uh, you're probably going to damage the wok. So uh, get in the habit. Uh, every time that you finish cooking with the wok, uh, clean it. Before you do anything else, clean it. Uh, so I gave it a rinse. Um, then I'm taking a paper towel uh, and I'm just wiping this residual stuff off uh, like so. Uh, if you've ever cooked with a uh, uh, cast iron skillet before, uh, it's, it's a very similar process. Uh, so I'm wiping off all of this residual stuff. Then I'm adding a tiny little bit of vegetable oil. This is maybe half a tablespoon. Uh, and again, this is similar to uh, similar to the way that you do with a, a cast iron pan. Uh, we're just coating the whole thing with oil. Uh, very important, make sure that you coat the bottom and outside too. Uh, you don't want to just coat the inside. It's not just for coating the cooking surface. Uh, really what you're doing when you coat your carbon steel and cast iron pans in oil is you're protecting it from oxidation. Uh, so it's not just for cooking surface, it's just it's to make sure that the pan doesn't start rusting. Uh, so that means that you also have to coat the outside, uh, the handle, the whole thing. If it's made of, if it's made of uh, carbon steel, you need to coat it. Cool. And that is it. So super important when you're done cooking in a wok, uh, make sure that you season it. All right, so last up, uh, I'm gonna use a little bit of cilantro. Uh, if you're looking for a super traditional uh, patsy use, you probably won't see uh, the use of cilantro. It's probably more familiar, more similar, or more commonly used in a pad, a pad thai. Uh, but I happen to have really, really fresh cilantro, so I'm gonna use it, because it's really fresh. further than the rinse and paper towel. Um, no, uh, that's it. Uh, rinse it, wipe it down, paper towel, that's it. Uh, don't, uh, you, you can if you want to, if it's like really dirty. So like if you, if you, sometimes I mess up stuff on the wok and I have to clean it because it's like something has stuck to it. Uh, sometimes when I like, uh, especially if I'm working on a new recipe or if I'm not paying attention, stuff will stick or burn to the wok. Uh, a couple days ago I was doing a meatball and I burned the meatball. So like part of the, the ground beef uh, got burned to the wok. 
uh, and then I did have to scrub it. Uh, that's not the end of the world. You can absolutely scrub your wok. Um, you can totally scrub it with soap, soap and water too. That's just fine. Um, I personally don't like doing that, um, mostly because I feel like it removes some of the seasoning. Uh, but I have been told by many people that it's perfectly fine to uh, scrub with soap and water, and it's it's fine. <clears throat> um, what was I gonna say? Yeah. Uh, other than, but uh, on a regular basis, though, if I'm not like scrubbing something off, uh, I don't I don't actually clean it with soap and water. I pro pretty much just give it a rinse. Uh, wipe everything off and then coat it in oil and that's I do the same thing with my cast iron skillets too uh, I have found um, someone someone gave me this this advice and it was super useful actually uh, is that if something is really stuck on uh, instead of using a sponge just use the use a wooden spoon and scrub it off with the spoon uh, and that will avoid damaging the seasoning a little bit so and I actually found that that, that actually does work so uh, same thing with ca uh, cast iron skillets too uh, is it important to cook with a wok often? Um, I cook with it a lot. That's why my wok is so seasoned. Um, I cook with my wok probably like five, five, six days a week probably. Uh, and that's why it has so much seasoning. I don't think it's that important that you use it all the time. I, I think it's more important that you uh, take care of it when you're done cooking with it. So you could use your wok once a month and uh, as long as you take care of it and uh, season it properly when you're done cooking, uh, you're not gonna have any problems. Um, but uh, definitely make sure that you're, you're caring for it properly when you're done cooking. Uh, make sure that you store it properly. I like keeping mine in my oven. Uh, woks are really annoying to store because they're really large and awkwardly shaped. Uh, but yeah, it's very simple. Uh, just make sure that you coat it properly when you're done cooking and you'll be okay. Cool. Yeah. Cool. Uh, I think I got everyone. I don't know. I probably missed some questions because uh, I wasn't looking. Uh, this chat scrolls really fast, so sometimes I miss stuff. Uh, but if I missed any questions, feel free to repeat your questions. I know that uh, um, some lots of folks have popped in and off, so I know I know I probably missed something. So um, if you if you, I did miss your question, feel free to repeat it. I also will be circling back. Uh, and if I did miss anything, I'll circle back and answer it in a written form too. So uh, if you're watching on YouTube and I missed a question, there are quite a few comments. Uh, that live chat will probably, I think it disappears when I, when I turn the chat off. So if I missed a question, uh, feel free to repeat it on the video itself uh, after I sign off uh, and uh, I'll answer. Um, but yeah, lots of times, I think on YouTube, I think that live chat is going to disappear when I turn the, the stream off. So. Oh, show us the fridge. Yeah. Um, let's see. Let's go to this. Let's, can I just do this? Could be tricky. Uh, let's see. All of the cameras are like locked in place. Okay. Ooh, this might not work. I don't think this is gonna work. I'm very committed to this. Yeah, I don't think it's gonna work. Sorry, guys. <laughs> um, but let's see. I will have to figure out a different way of doing this next time. Uh, oh, you know what I could do? I'll do this. Oh, uh, no, this is not gonna work. Yeah, sorry guys. Uh -huh, let me put this back. Yeah, fridge stores are hard because you got to take the camera down.
All right. Anyway, sorry guys, I tried, but the uh, next video I'll try and try and do it. Um, thanks for watching, everyone. The next thing that we're streaming is General Sauce Chicken, I think. I believe next stream is General Sauce Chicken. That's going to be tomorrow. Uh, 6.30 PST, we'll be doing some General Sauce Chicken. Uh, the version that we'll be doing, if you're following along, is the second version from the YouTube video. Uh, and that version uses a, more specifically, uses a double fry. Uh, and we're going to be walking through how to use a double fry. Why, why do you double fry stuff? Uh, the double fry, I b believe it was invented by, maybe not invented, but definitely made popular by J. Kenji Lopez, uh, who's one of my like all-time heroes, and I love that guy. Uh, and uh, someone promised that he would introduce me. Uh, but I have not, not yet met Jen, J. Kenji Lopez. But yes, the version that we're going to do in, uh, uses a double fry, and I'm going to be talking about why it's really useful to use a double fry, how it creates really, really crunchy uh, fried chicken. Uh, that's going to be tomorrow, 6.30 PST um, for dinner. Uh, the version that we're going to be doing is my own version, uh, but it's loosely based off of a Panda Express hack that I wrote, uh, and that kind of incorporates a lot of like more traditional Chinese ingredients and uh, sort of kind of walks through some of that those those steps. Um, all of that stuff up on the YouTube channel if you're watching on YouTube already. Uh, it's the channel that you're watching on uh, and uh, I think the next couple of streams are already listed up on the YouTube channel so the schedule of things that we're going to be cooking uh, all on the YouTube channel already so uh, if you're interested in cooking along with me I recommend checking out that schedule and seeing what you want to cook uh, and cook some stuff with me it's super fun it's always more fun to cook with other people because then we can like talk about the things that we messed up uh, how we messed it up why it's like why those mistakes happen I know that I make mistakes all the time some folks have asked me, like, do I never make, make mistakes, which is absolutely categorically not true. I make mistakes on almost every single thing that I have ever cooked. Uh, I make a lot of mistakes. Um, but I just, like, do a good job about, like, improvising and, like, making, like, making, make the, making the best out of my mistakes. So, uh, yeah. So, definitely, if you're interested in cooking alongside me uh, or reproducing the things that we're cooking, all of the recipe videos and... Uh, all of the schedules for the things that I'm going to be cooking on stream live on the YouTube channel. So uh, if you're already on YouTube, thanks for hopping over. Thanks for helping me hit 1,000 subscribers. I'm sorry that Hamcharo didn't show up today. Uh, Hamcharo, if you've watched before, is the hamster that eats ramen. Uh, and he's my favorite little guy. But he only gets to eat when people subscribe, so please keep subscribing. Uh, I don't know what we're at right now, but someone told me that we hit 1,000 subscribers, so that's super awesome. Uh, thanks for... Uh, Thanks for making this a thing. I've never never thought that I would have a cooking channel, but here I am and I have a cooking channel, so super fun. Um, let's see. Yeah, check out the recipe video for this pad CU. Uh, I released that earlier today. I think that happened a couple hours ago, actually. Um, so that's going to be super fun to check out. And uh, yeah, if you haven't yet, check out Nicha Thai, my favorite restaurant, uh, my favorite Thai restaurant here in Oakland, too. So. Uh, all right, thanks for watching everyone. I'll see you soon. Bye. Oh, I have a good idea. All right, so if you're watching on Reddit and you want the uh, refrigerator tour, I think I have an idea for this. Um, but it requires that I do this. So I can't do this with two cameras. So I can't do this on Reddit, but I can do this on YouTube. So. Yeah, it works. All right, so let's watch on YouTube. There it goes. All right. Here's my fridge. I went grocery shopping today. There's not a lot of fun stuff in my fridge, to be honest. We've got uh, some leftovers. That's some Christmas ham. Uh, some pre-grated Parmesan cheese because I like to be lazy. Uh, Watercrests, really useful. This is very useful. Uh, for like creating fun crunchy bits in things like meatballs uh, So I'm gonna be doing or I did some uh, Shanghai East Lions Head meatballs a couple days ago, and I used those water crests uh, That's where that nice bit of crunch comes from in those meatballs um, Hummus miso paste lots of miso paste on the door Let's see Any fun stuff uh, Sake I think this is soju as so we got some soju uh, I think it's really cheap soju. Uh, fridge, I recently uh, organized my fridge or freezer. So we have uh, lots, lots and lots of meat. Uh, chicken thigh, ground turkey, ground beef, 
uh, ground pork, uh, pork chops, uh, which I haven't had a chance to use yet. Uh, this is my bag of, of food, uh, food scraps. Uh, very useful to save your food scraps. You can make stocks. Um, what else? Here's the pantry. Mm, got a lot of random stuff in the pantry. Flour, peanut butter. Uh, this is my deep fryer oil. We'll be using this later. It is very dark, actually. My deep fryer oil. Maybe time to time to mix the deep fryer oil. But all right. I think that's it, everyone. I'll see you soon. Bye. Take out just a moth, put them back 
Thank you.